So, Norman, it turns out that you and I aren't special unicorns after all. No, we're not. Because you and I have both had the misfortune of having symptomatic COVID, but it turns out there are some people out there who have a special gene that protects them against it. That's right. We'll get into that in just a second because this is Coronacast, the show all about the coronavirus, sometimes other nasties as well. I'm health reporter Tegan Taylor coming to you from Jagera and Turrbal land. And I'm physician and journalist Dr Norman Swan coming to you from Gadigal land. So Norman, we were just talking about this asymptomatic gene, this gene that helps protect some people, a few, a small number, from the symptoms of COVID. What, what's the science? Just a little bit of background here. There's been a theory around for a while that for any infection, there is a proportion of people who are going to be resistant just because of some random genetic issue or genetic benefit, if you like, and it's certainly true of HIV. So this they've discovered is, and they looked at a massive number of bone marrow donors, and they were able to relate it to their history of infection of COVID-19, whether they were symptomatic and asymptomatic. And when you're a registered bone marrow donor, um, you have extensive immune workup in terms of what's called your HLA system. This is the system that recognises foreign material in your body. In fact, it's what Professor Peter Doherty partly won his Nobel Prize for. And, um, and what they found was that there was a very small group within the sample who had been infected but who were asymptomatic and it related to a particular HLA type. So this is the pattern of these recognition molecules they've got, you've got. And the th the, what they think is the case is that this HLA type, um, if, when you're exposed to the common cold, in other words, a coronavirus, a seasonal coronavirus that causes the common cold, um, it, if you've got this HLA type, it primes your T cells, these are your attacking immune cells, to attack COVID-19 as well. So in fact, it's a cross benefit here. So it's not that you've got it originally and just having the gene affect you, it's that the gene plus your previous history of cold viruses then confers some extra protection against symptomatic COVID-19 disease. That is so cool. What sort of proportion of people are we talking about here? I think it was something like, I haven't got it in front of me, 100 odd people out of 30,000. So it's small. Oh, hugely small. So yeah. can you borrow this gene? Like, is there any way that we could turn this into a treatment or a protection for COVID? Not yet, but you're, you really are born with this HLA type rather than acquire it. Interesting. But what it might do is identify... Uh, molecules on the surface of T cells, which you might be able to manipulate in the same way that H the HLA type manipulates it. So it's not it's not a useless discovery. It may lead to something in terms of protection, but not just yet. So continuing with COVID news from the week, there's also been a, been a study that's looking at how Omicron, which we know is hugely infectious, how it actually spreads. Yeah, this is a Chinese study looking at Omicron. It kind of answers the questions that people want to know when they've got Omicron. And very briefly, they studied, uh, I think, about 2,000 people um, and they serially did nose swabs and took blood samples from them over a period... Cereal, like breakfast food? Yeah, not cornflakes. Um, <laughs> this is uh, cereal as in, you know, watching a cereal on television, one thing after the other. Oh, or so, like a podcast. Yeah, more like a podcast, yeah. So, you know, episode one, episode two. In this case, it was symptomatic disease, day of symptomatic disease. Serial two was, you know, the subsequent days after infection. So what they found was that you're on average producing the most virus about three days after your first symptom. And most people had cleared the virus by a couple of weeks. There's been other studies that look at this, look at viral load at different times of your infection to sort of figure out when you're most likely to infect other people. How does this compare to those? Because I know that one of the things about COVID is that you can spread it before you get any symptoms. That's right. So this study did not look at that. It simply looked at viral load rather than infectivity. The other thing about this study is it's not entirely clear the vaccination status of, of these people. And also Chinese vaccines are not necessarily as effective as uh, the vaccines that we've been lucky enough to obtain. So those are um, relatively unanswered questions. Okay, and Norman, one more piece of news before we get into the meat of this episode. And this is something that people might not have heard of before because it's really something in the academic community, but it protects us all. It's a website called ProMed and it's sort of looking at emerging diseases. 
and it's at risk because of a lack of funding. Yes, people don't know about this, but it's, it's essentially a network, as you suggest, of infectious disease experts around the world, and they report outbreaks, and they're particularly looking for emergent outbreaks around the world or unusual disease outbreaks of existing infections. And it's an important surveillance mechanism. Um, it's not been well supported, and they are running out of money. Um, they're also finding that their data are, are being taken by other people. There's been data scraping of their data used for other purposes for which they haven't been reimbursed. And they're not looking to make money out of this, but they need to fund the process. And they put out a funding call a few months ago uh, for a million dollars and only got 20,000. Mm. And this is one of the structures internationally, one of the few structures internationally, which actually monitors disease outbreaks in a global network of altruistic individuals. And it is underfunded. And it makes you wonder, again, just how much we've learned from this pandemic in terms of global monitoring of new and emergent threats. Yeah, you'd think if there was ever a time where we where its value would be self-evident, it would be now. That's right. Um, and they make that point. So what they've done is they've removed their public, the public access to data. So people are going to have to pay for it or subscribe to their service to actually get it so that they get some income, which is a shame as well. Are they the only group that are doing this globally? No, there's an influenza, there's a global influenza network, which is much more formally organised around the World Health Organisation and influenza surveillance centres, which we've got one in Australia. Um, so global influenza is much better monitored on a systematic basis. But these, uh, this network is looking for anything that comes along, uh, from chikungunya to other diseases. So, Norman, back to answering some of our listener questions. And one question that's come through deals with something that, again, we spoke about a lot early in the pandemic and we haven't really spoken about so much recently, and that's wastewater surveillance. This person has written in saying, I would like to know what the recent wastewater analysis results are showing regarding coronavirus, especially as the incident rates for new cases might be vastly underestimating the actual number of cases because people aren't testing as much, but we might be able to find it in the poo. So the Victorians report wastewater surveillance. Other jurisdictions do as well. Some not as uh, in as detailed a form as Victoria. Um, the, uh, the the variants are still Omicron variants that are being picked up from um, from the wastewater. Um, XBB one point one six is still um, the dominant variant, but it's only at at twenty six percent of the variants discovered. So there's a lot of different kinds of. Omicron out there in the community. And I think the general trend does, the wastewater does seem to reflect the, the case reports, but the case reports are obviously small, but you know, you don't know how many cases there are, but the general trend does seem to be uh, monitored, followed by the wastewater findings, as do the deaths. So we, at the moment, we're seeing a decline and down to pretty low levels in the case reports, deaths and hospitalizations, but there was a surge in June. Um, there'll be another surge coming, um, but the wastewater is really just telling us that there's still community transmission going on, which we knew about already, and we know what sub-variants of the virus are out there. So nothing new is, is emerging. Did you say stool community transmission going on, Norman? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but my that's not the, Scottish accent. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the only thing they're finding in, in wastewater. No. Um, just the other day, um, there was a report from the National Wastewater Drug Monitoring Program, which is part of the Australian Crime Intelligence Commission. It's done by the University of Queensland with the University of South Australia. They're looking for, they're looking for drugs in the poo, because this is something that they've actually done for years now, pre-pandemic. Pre, um, well, it's not just poo, that uh, Tegan, that goes into the sewage. Okay. Um, tell, me, tell me which bodily fluids it comes out of, your, Norman. Your wee goes in. To your pee goes into the sewage system too, and some of these drugs you pee out okay. because when you get arrested and taken to the, to the, the the cop shop, I think they can do a urine sample as well as a blood of sample. Of course, so, yes. So it's pee, not just poo, um, and it may be more poo with COVID, but this is pee. <laughs> if you got, I'm sorry, just uh, you know, I'm losing it here. Anyway. What they found was, I mean, it really was quite interesting, was this is 57 wastewater sites monitored nationally, covering a population of about 14 million people. So in capital cities, they tended to measure methamphetamine, ice, 
cocaine, MDMA, MDA, heroin and ketamine. Regional areas, it was more alcohol, nicotine, oxycodone and a narcotic, fentanyl, which we know of from the United States, and cannabis. And briefly, what they showed was that heroin, oxycodone and cannabis decreased, which is good news because oxycodone is largely a prescribed drug. Alcohol, methamphetamine, ice, cocaine, MDMA, uh, fentanyl and ketamine increased, which is a worry. And when you compare us internationally, we, with ICE, ranked third of 25 countries oh. in ICE consumption and in cocaine consumption, we were 18th out of 27 score countries. I don't know why they call them score, score countries. There must be this, uh, what, I don't know what score stands for, but you know what it stands for in the street um, in terms <laughs> of scoring drugs. I just love how you're up with the drug lingo. If you take cannabis, for example, we're 6th out of 16 and MDMA 21st out of 27. So we're lower down the list with, with, um, with ecstasy. So, I mean... We, we go on about interdiction and we go on about the Ill illicit drug market, but when the demand's there, people will import the drugs. So is this something that they're going to continue doing and, and sort of see if interventions are working or not working, or they can then target things to certain areas because they know that that's where those drugs are being used? Yeah, it's so we do do occasionally national mental health surveys, national drug use surveys, household use surveys of drugs, and that's often done by the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre at the University of New South Wales. This is... This eliminates the the interview probability. If somebody phones you up and said, when was the last time you used ICE? You're going to tell a strange interviewer that on the phone? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, or you might occasionally. This way, it's a much more objective measure. So this is the 19th report in this series. So they're continuing to do it. It's providing useful information and gives feedback to law enforcement, but also to health authorities about the use of these drugs. Because the main he aim here in Australia is harm reduction. And once the, these drugs are out there, how do you reduce harm? How do you try and reduce use through um, you know, supply, education, and so on? And, um, and for you know, the crime authorities, it's interdiction. What's, what's slipping through that they didn't know about? Oh, wastewater surveillance, not just for COVID, also for drugs as well. So who would have thought you could get high from your wee? <laughs> you can get high from your own wee, Norman. <laughs> Okay, we're going too far on this one. We'll see you next week. We'll see you then. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.